Welcome to the Prospective Doctor Podcast, brought to you by Med School Coach. Pre-med and medical students alike are encouraged to tune in each week for tips on how to become a strong med school candidate, gain acceptance into the school of your dreams, and succeed on your journey toward residency and becoming a doctor. Hello, everyone. I'm super excited to have our guest for today, Dr. Ali Hader. I'm just going to give him an opportunity to just tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, absolutely. And thanks for having me on your podcast. So my name is Dr. Ali Hader. I'm an interventional cardiologist, which means I specialize in obviously cardiology treatment of patients with heart disease and, you know, subspecialize in procedures involving the heart, minimally invasive catheter-based procedures involving multiple different cool things uh, in the heart. I am uh, practicing in uh, Massachusetts for the past eight years. My first job out of training and you know, we'll talk a little bit about that later. I'm also assistant professor of uh, medicine at University of Massachusetts, which is the main hospital I work at as an affiliate with that medical school. I work in a very busy private practice and also sort of in this hybrid model. So I'm in private practice, but I get to work a lot with trainees and do a lot of education as well in the hospital I'm at. So I sort of have this fusion model of very, very busy clinical medicine, but also sort of an academic educational model. And of course, in my spare time, I do a lot of a social media education through my um, a very busy account on Instagram, as well as Twitter and YouTube. And that's really um, been really fantastic. And I think it's really provided a lot of value for folks. Um, you know, everywhere from medical pre-med and med students all the way to practicing docs. And I'm also about to be a dad any one of these days now. So congratulations. So, uh, thank you. In a nutshell, that's that's who I am. That's awesome. So we you are doing a lot of different things. So we'll probably hit on a few of those, but I want us to take it way back when when you decided to become a doctor. Can you tell yep. the students listening what motivated you to pursue career in medicine? Good question. So, you know, for me, my dad was also a doctor. So, you know, I've for somewhat fall into that typical stereotype, you know, brown guy whose dad was a doctor and from Pakistan and they wanted him to be a doctor and all that sorts of stuff. Right. But, you know, interestingly, so my dad was a cardiologist in New Jersey. He was at New Jersey Medical School forever. Certainly by osmosis, I was sort of you know, interested in it and felt that, oh, this is some career um, that I may be interested in. But to be honest with you, I was never really pushed into medicine, which is great. My parents really wanted me to kind of figure out what I wanted to do and I appreciate it. And um, through college and whatnot, I, I actually wasn't sure I wanted to be a doctor. I was exposed to medicine early in high school, of course, among many other sort of clubs and all these sorts of things. I was involved in the pre-med society and, you know, trying to get exposure to medicine in the life of a doctor, which I think is super important. You know, a lot of times we think we know what we want to do, but if you're not really exposed to it, you don't really know what's involved in it. So, you know, I was involved in that and, you know, I was, I was like, oh, this is cool, but I want to really look at all the other sort of um, opportunities that were out there. Um, when I went to college, which was at Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut, the liberal arts school, which was, uh, I enjoyed because I really was able to sort of you know, didn't really have stringent criteria on what I had to take. I could, you know, decide if I wanted to be pre-med even my second or third year and still fulfill it. So at one point I really wanted to do business or econ and these sorts of things. But so I kind of delved into that. But in the end, I just, you know, I feel like there's a percentage of population who are just, you know, who flock to the sciences and, you know, those sorts of things. And that was kind of my mind. I was always better and I enjoyed the sciences. I enjoyed that sort of uh, analytical type of thinking more than, you know, um, you know, more than business and numbers and those sorts of things. So I became interested in medicines just sort of by experimenting and the things And I always tell folks, look, when you, especially when you're a pre-med going to college, make sure you don't just make that decision you know, too soon. You have to explore. You have to, you know, you have to convince yourself that's what you want to do. Don't just go there. Oh, because my dad and my mom told me to do it. Oh, I think this is the career I want. If you don't explore, then you know you risk yourself going down the line and making regrets. And then by then it's too late. So I'm really happy that I was able to, you know, engage in many different sorts of fields and in, in, in college. And that was important because then you kind of figure out what you really want to do. And that's I would say it wasn't until late sophomore year of college that I really decided that I wanted to be a doctor and a physician and because solely because that's just the part of my brain I thought was better and I was just good at it and I was most interested in it. And then, you know, the story from there evolves into what type of medicine, but 
you know, the, the initial sort of decision is, you know, what sort of area you want to go to. So that it wasn't until then that I really figured out, despite my father being a cardiologist and lo and behold, I ended up becoming a cardiologist. <laughs> I love that you said that because it's very important. And it's kind of weird for me being the host of this show to, I always encourage the students to say like, if there's absolutely anything else that you can think of besides pursuing medicine, try that first. And then if you still have the inkling, go for it because it's, it's really a lifelong commitment <laughs> and there are many thousands of ways to help people. But if this is your calling, it's your calling. So I love that you mentioned that it's it's okay to explore those other interests. And it definitely brought you back to here. Yeah, absolutely. You also mentioned that um, your dad is a cardiologist and lo and behold, you've become one. Mm -hmm. Are there any other specialties that you consider? Yeah. So I went through a lot of different, you know, ex uh, explorations of what I wanted to do, right? So at one point, I really wanted to do ENT surgery because somebody who I knew whose dad was ENT, he's like, oh, he's got a great life. It's a mix of inpatient, outpatient, he gets cool procedures, he gets office time, nice balance, good lifestyle, good money, all those sorts of stuff. So, you know, um, but I hated snot and I was like, that's out. <laughs> um, I thought about a surgical subspecialty, right? Because I really, I knew I wanted to do something procedural, you know, I just didn't want to just talk to people. I wanted to sort of do something procedural. So I did think about surgery, but you know, it was just, I just wasn't into it. I didn't like the OR very much. I hate waking up at 5 a.m. Obviously has a reputation of being a brutal specialty and, you know, then going on to subspecialty from surgery, it's just a long road. So uh, I also thought about interventional radiology, which I seriously considered. Uh, I actually liked radiology. I liked the imaging aspect of things. And then, you know, the interventional radiology, cool procedures, catheter-based, it's not like surgery. It's in some ways similar to interventional cardiology because it's minimally invasive. And you get to do all kinds of cool procedures for all different sort of fields and specialties. And I like the fact that you were sort of, you know, you were involved in every specialty in some way or another. But then, you know, going to general radiology, I didn't think I could sit in a dark room and all day and not have patient contact. And that kind of pushed me away from that. So those were the, those were the, those were my other potential thoughts and then I knew, eventually I knew I wanted to do something within internal medicine. I didn't want to do general internal medicine. Mm -hmm. um, and cardiology, I, I, I picked because I thought it had an awesome balance of medicine, surgery in the way of procedures, and especially the way that things have been evolving in terms of our, our collaboration with surgical subspecialties, the innovative procedures, mix of office and hospital, you know, radiology is involved in it a little bit. And you have to put a radiology hat on. We have to put our medicine hat on. We have to put our ICU hat on. So, and of course, everyone's got heart disease. So to me, it was the nicest balance that incorporated all the kind of interest that I had that made me look to those other fields, but in one little package. That makes a lot of sense. It, it is kind of a nice marriage of different aspects of medicine that keep you engaged and keep your day, I guess, varied from there to here to there. What is your favorite procedure in interventional cardiology? Sure. I'm sure my favorite procedures evolved over time, but I would say as of now, I would say the TAVR procedure is my favorite procedure, which is a transcatheter aortic valve replacement. This is how we replace um, aortic heart valves um, minimally invasively by just using a tube up the artery in the leg. This is a procedure we traditionally were had to do open heart surgery for, and only in the last 10 years have we really been, um, you know, this has come into play. And in the fact, only in the last several years has this become the go-to primary way we treat patients with um, the most common heart valve disorder, which is aortic valve stenosis. Um, and, you know, I joke that, you know, our field is largely as plumbers, right? We open up things <laughs> and open up blockages like heart attacks and heart blockages. We put catheters and wires in to put in stents to open up blockages. And just like that, we open up the blockages of the aortic heart valve. And it just, it, it exemplifies the innovation, the advancements in the just amazing technology and, you know, advancements we have occurred and how we can benefit our patients, you know, going from a four hour long open heart surgery procedure um, in general anesthesia to a one hour procedure with, with barely any sedation sometimes that patients can go home the next day and immediate satisfaction. They feel so much better, you know, um, and I love these patients. They're old and wispy and they're, they got spunk and, you know, they're so satisfied and it's really satisfying and it's quick. So I, I think right now that's one of probably my favorite procedure to do and probably will be for a long period of time. That's amazing. Now, shifting gears, you mentioned that you have a lot of involvement with 
students and residents and different various aspects of their training, what do you think makes a good student? So I don't think there's one thing, you know, everybody has a specific um, strength, right? Mm -hmm. But I think one thing that's super important is number one, I mean, in, in the world of medicine, right? There's everyone's got different skill sets. You may be book smart, you may be good with your hands, you may be able to quote the trials, you may know how to talk to people. But at the end of the day, the common ground is you need to, number one, be present, right? You need to you need to prove, and especially for students who sometimes don't get a lot of airtime, they may only be on a rotation for a short period of time and they have to make it, have an opportunity to stand out. And it's crazy because sometimes it, in just a few weeks time, that's the period of time that it takes for you to stand out, to get a good letter, to really, you know, make yourself, you know, visible. But I think being present, meaning, you know, be around, be there, make sure they know that you're there. And, and be involved, ask questions. You have to engage. You know, you can't just be there and be quiet. You can't just slip in, slip out just to get it done. No, you have to engage. You have to make it known that you're there. You know, don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to jump in. Don't be afraid to show interest. The ones who actually ask me questions show interest. I don't even care if they don't know anything. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some people who like, I know their knowledge base is poor, but I appreciate their interest and their ability to interact and communicate. And then I sometimes will take them under my wing. I'll have one person who's super smart. I'm like, you're good. I have one person who's like, has work to do, but you know, the interest they show being interactive, you see that passion in there, right? Mm -hmm. You can see, you know, us uh, folks can see like, are you just there to be there or are you actually interested in it, right? So that genuine, that genuine sort of, you know, characteristics I think are super important. So, um, and I love students to, you know, really, you know, and, you know, people can be shy and that's okay. You know, you don't have to do it in front of other folks, but, you know, try to, show that you're actually interested, you're there, you're invested with your time and your mind. And that's all that matters. Less so your knowledge base, because you're not expected to know that much. Mm -hmm. I actually prefer someone who knows very little, who's actually trying to learn and ask questions rather than that know it all, who was book smart, who's trying to like pop in and you know answer questions in the middle. You know, you can tell those folks. So that's, that's one of the most important things for me for a student. I love that. And I love that you mentioned that it's important, one, to be engaged, because even if you're not interested in a specific specialty, you're there to learn and you're there for a limited amount of time. So you should be able to absorb everything that you're getting from that. And it's not a time to check out. You're paying for this education and it's invaluable. And in terms of kind of being respectful of one another and not being a know-it-all and, and all of those kind of things. There's always something to learn and to gain from a certain experience. So it's really important to show your engagement. You might learn something, you might gain a mentor. And in that Absolutely. realm, yes, how would and you- in, in fact, just to add on that, I still, as a student, I still remember little nuggets and tidbits of information from my psychiatry rotation, from my GU rotation, from little things that I learned that I carry with me to this day mm -hmm. as cardiology. And once in a while, guess what? You're going to interact with that specialty and you're going to remember that fact. And you're going to use that fact. You're going to use that little tidbit that you learned on a specialty that you had no desire to go into. And that's going to either help a patient, it's going to make you look good, or it's going to you know, contribute to you know, just the, the overall um, care of a certain situation. That's a really great point because you're gonna be using this information for a lifetime. Me, for instance, I'm a primary care doctor. So of course I kind of pull things all the time, but Absolutely. when you bring in that thing like a, a surgeon or a psychiatry psychiatrist, yep. They may not necessarily, they may see a patient and say, okay, they need to be referred in because they're having this extra issue or even a family member. Like you may, everyone, you'll notice as you get into your further along in your education, people are going to call you even maybe in your first year and be like, okay, what do I need? I'm having this reflux. So it may be something you can take and use in your own personal life. A hundred percent correct. You're there to learn, right? That's yes. the bottom line. Don't, don't, don't get caught on, you know, there's some people who know exactly what they want to do and everything else is just a hurdle for them to get through. That is the wrong approach. You need to absorb everything and you're not going to be able to do that again. Absolutely. At Med School Coach, we know that getting into medical school is hard. In fact, 
60% of pre-meds who apply to a medical school don't even get accepted. And if you want to get accepted into a top medical school, it's even harder. That's why more students than ever are turning to MCAT Tutoring by Med School Coach. Our tutors are all 99th percentile scorers, have been through rigorous training, and can help raise your MCAT score by 12 points or more. You need every competitive advantage you can get to get into med school, so why not get one-on-one -on -one tutoring from Med School Coach? Our expert team will create a custom program just for you and help you master MCAT content where you need the help most. You'll raise your MCAT score. We guarantee it. Visit us online at medschoolcoach.com and use offer code PODCAST10 to save 10%, up to $400, on a Med School Coach MCAT tutoring package. You can achieve your medical school dreams, and Med School Coach can help. You also mentioned that sometimes when people ask certain questions, which is very important to do because like we just mentioned, it's your time to do that. You may take them and, and kind of help nurture and guide them in certain ways as to like, for instance, how to give an appropriate presentation or something like that. For students out there looking to seek mentorship from either senior residents or attendees, how would you suggest that they go about asking for that? It's a great question. Number one, I think they have to understand, look, you are a student, right? Mm -hmm. Some people, you know, the culture in med school is like, we kind of feel like, oh my God, we got to kill these exams. Oh my God, I have to go to this clerkship and just get a good score. And they get so anxious about performance, they forget to learn, right? So I, I think my, um, my recommendation is early on the rotation, day one, day two, you know, sit down with the resident, sit down with your senior resident, figure out what your goals are understand your knowledge base and sit with them and be like, Hey, listen, you know, be honest with them. Don't pretend to like you're going to internal medicine and you want to do surgery. Don't pretend I want to do internal medicine. That's the yeah. wrong approach. We do this too much. You know, this is what I want to do, but I'm here to learn. And I feel like this is what I want to get out of this rotation. That's what I would like to help go to the attending, say the same thing, start early, get it out in the beginning of the rotation where the expectations are, are no, right. And be honest. I, I hate it when people pretend like they're interested in something because you can see through that. Mm -hmm. Just be true to yourself. So look, look, I, I want to, I'm here to learn. Get it out there. Get out there early. Because if you wait several weeks and goes by, you're going to be more, it's going to be more difficult for you to go out there and, you know, ask questions. And, you know, if you've never asked a question or you've never sort of laid your cards out from the beginning. So I always tell people, look, try to set up, even if it's a five minute meeting with your resident, senior resident, fellow attending, and just, you know, give them a, give them a sense of who you are, what you've learned along the ways, because we don't often know that, you know, how many students come and go. Right. But I appreciate when I hear that because it tells me they're interested and I will always remember that person, even from that five minute conversation, even if they don't, you know, they barely speak the whole rest of the rotation. So I think that is a good strategy I would suggest. I think that information is absolutely golden because one is sex expectation. So you're there to accomplish a goal of learning, number one, but you're also going to be graded. So it'd be great to set expectations with what they expect of you and all yep. of that early on so it won't get to the end of the rotation and you have a surprise. And, and on top of that, setting the, letting them know what your interests are may be beneficial to you. Whereas someone who may want to go into cardiology, you may tell them a little bit more information about that, but say someone wants to go into surgery, you may gear their lessons towards talking about how to do a pre-op exam. Or if you're talking to a student who's interested in radiology, you may go and look at the images more on their rotation. So you may gain more out of it by just being transparent. That's so correct, because then you'll remember that, oh, this is the kid who wants to do radiology. Oh, let's have them involved in this. And you, rem those are the things you remember. You know, Absolutely. that's totally correct. Excellent point. Absolutely. Now, you also mentioned that you're very active on social media. Can you tell us a little bit about why you think that it's important for physicians to educate via the modalities that are out there? Yeah. Well, one of the main reasons is because whether you like it or not, information online and social media is being absorbed at a rapid rate by people left and right. You know, every year, more and more people 
are utilizing social media to get their information. And unfortunately, we all know it's written with misinformation, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is an excellent platform to reach millennials, Gen Ys, and Zs, and all those folks who are, um, you know, flocking to these platforms. You know, the era of the textbook is seemingly less important these days. So, you know, and and it's amazing how many people, um, you know, whether it's incidental where they run across um, as they're scrolling social media or they actually seek it out on social media. So um, I think it's important because it gives you a lot of reach. I think for people who enjoy education, it's an excellent platform to be able to exercise that, you know, especially like I know a lot of physicians out there who don't work in academic centers or private centers, but they're really smart people. And this is a way for them to, you know, sort of get their knowledge and share it with others. And of course, it's, you know, whether you like it or not, it's it's flooded with inaccuracies and inaccurate information. So I think it's uh, upon ourselves. And, you know, this is how your conversation for all you know, a whole other session, but it's upon ourselves to sort of try to, you know, fight fire with fire and and put that accurate information out there. This is the things that, you know, no better, no better um, analogy than COVID that we're seeing, right? So it's our responsibility to sort of try to get that information out there and, um, you know, evidence-based information and teach folks, lay people, non-medical people, what's sort of um, how doctors look at things, the analytical way of thinking things, because, you know, the media sometimes, you know, and sends the messages that are mixed. And aside from that, just educational value for students and, you know, people from nurses to students to EMS to docs, it's, it's, it's really, really a lot you can do on these platforms that was not always appreciated because social media was seemingly designed for personal use and, you know, selfies and cat videos and all that stuff. But you know, there's so much more that we can do. We just have to structure it that and, you know, make it our own. So I, you know, I'm really bullish on that. And I think things have gotten more and more, you know, since I started using social media, I'm seeing a lot more docs out there, you know, sharing knowledge, which I think is fantastic. Um, I wish I had that when I was in training. And, um, you know, I just think there's a lot of value there. I love it. I think it's important that you mention those things because we do have this educational advantage where we can share this knowledge with people where they're getting the information. Traditionally, a lot of patients would get the information on their after visit care summary and they would go right in the trash on their way out. So Mm -hmm. it's interesting to meet people where they are learning things on Instagram and TikTok and Facebook and all of these different places so that you can reach them. And then also utilizing this technology to educate the healthcare leaders of the future. They, like you mentioned, the nurses or the students, especially now during the time of COVID where people are not interacting one-on-one and you're not having a lot of interactions with Grand Rounds, you can kind of alter the way information is disseminated. And I think that's amazing. Yeah. Can you, you can com- you can com- Yeah, you mean you can combine education entertainment, right? Edutain edutainment or edutainment, yeah. however you want to call it, right? So and, and people like that small digestible formulation. Of course it's a double edged sword because it's sometimes hard to validate information. There's a lot of BS out there and you know, so there, it's not all cut and dry. It's, there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff to weed through and sometimes there can be dangerous information. So, you know, there, there's still a lot to be, you know, be cautious about, but, you know, it's not necessarily that much different than real world before social media, because there are always people like that out there. It's just, um, you know, for every smart person that gives value that has reach, there's another, you know, a charlatan that also has reach that is trying to delve, you know, um, shady information. So it's it's something that we're going to have to obviously deal with and be cautious about. And hopefully it gets better over time, especially in the healthcare realm. Absolutely. Would you be able to share where our listeners can find you on social media? Yeah, absolutely. Um, If you um on Instagram, which is probably my most biggest account, it's at your heart doc. All right. Just just as it spells your heart doc. Um, and YouTube also your heart doc is the same. And on Twitter, I'm your heart doc one because some other dude took your heart doc. <laughs> it will for they wouldn't give it to me. <laughs> for the listeners out there, we'll also post it in the show notes, but I wanted you guys to hear it. At Med School Coach, we know that matching into the specialty of your choice and the residency program of your dreams has a dramatic impact on your career as a physician. 
and your USMLE score is the most important acceptance factor of all. That's why more students than ever are turning to Med School Coach for USMLE tutoring. Our tutors are all 260 plus scorers and have been through rigorous training. Plus, the average student who uses Med School Coach tutoring raises their score by 23 to 55 points. There is an enormous amount of material you need to know for step one and step two, and Med School Coach can help you be smart about how to study. We'll create a custom program just for you. Then, we'll help you master USMLE concepts where you need help most. You'll raise your USMLE score. We guarantee it. Visit us online at medschoolcoach.com and use offer code PODCAST10 to save 10% up to $400 on a Med School Coach USMLE tutoring package. You can achieve your medical school dreams and Med School Coach can help. So I thank you for all of the amazing pearls of wisdom you shared with us today. For my final question, I want you to share with us one pearl of wisdom both for pre-medical students and medical students that you wish that you would have known if, as you started your medical journey? Sure. So for pre-medical students, I mean, I would say, number one, make sure you look at the big picture. Look, look, not just my idea of getting in med school, look downstream. And this is important, right? I mean, you, you there's some people who, because I see people go to med school and then they either drop out in med school or they drop out in residency. This is not easy. This is a big sacrifice. There's a lot of monetary, you know, um, you know, sacrifices. There's loans. You know, people want to have families. So just think about it. Chart out your future, how it would look, both time and finances. Do it with your family. Do it with your advisor, because it's really important to put that in perspective. Okay, you know, and I, I, I hate it when I see people who are too deep in that pathway, but they realize that this is not what they really wanted because nobody told them about it. So have conversations about it. Don't just think, oh, the idea of a doctor is good. You need to be invested in it and you need to make sure this is what you really want. And I'm not trying to dissuade people from it, but I want to make sure that you're all in if you get to this, you know? So that's for the pre-meds. For the med students, I would say, you know, um, think deeply about the field you want. I would, and I'm sure you've heard this before, but, you know, the idea of being a cardiologist, idea of being a neurosurgeon, idea of being certain fields is not necessarily the same as what reality is, right? So I would just say, be proactive and investigate and, you know, shadow folks, um, you know, do rotations and reach out to doctors. I have med students reach out to me all the time. I'm always happy to have conversations with them. I'm always happy to have them come join me for a day. It's really important to know what the bread and butter the bread and butter is of what a, a physician does. Not that, oh, that one cool thing to do. What they did do, usually nine to five, right? Because that's what's going to be what your life is going to be, right? Okay. So sometimes there's a disconnect there. So focus on that, not just the pathophysiology and the idea. Know what the daily lives are of a certain physician. That will set you up for happiness in the future. Thank you for that. I don't think I have anything to add. Those are very important lessons about just taking the bigger picture and taking a step back and looking in towards your future for planning, because this is something you're going to be doing for the next 30 or 40 years. So it's very important to know what you're getting into without the rose colored glasses. So very well said. I definitely appreciate you coming out here and talking to us. And like you said, for the social media, that's a whole nother conversation. Maybe yeah. we'll have you come back in a few months if you're willing. But thank you so much for coming. I'll give you an opportunity to say goodbye. All right, guys. Dan, thanks for having me. If anybody, you know, reach out to me. Um, my my Instagram DMs is a is a dark abyss of you know unread messages, but please reach out to me. Uh, I'll respond if I see it. Twitter the same. Find me on Clubhouse. I'm doing a lot of rooms, chatting about similar stuff. And I wish everyone the best of luck and, and hope to talk soon. Perfect. And for all you listeners out there, click the subscribe button and I'll see you again next week. Bye. Each episode of the Perspective Doctor podcast is brought to you by Med School Coach. To access articles, videos, webinars, and free tools to help you succeed on your journey toward medical school and beyond, visit our website, perspectivedoctor.com. We hope you tune in again next time.